Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm Jenny Brockpoller. I'm the director of the Ames Community Arts Council. Thank you all so much for joining us here tonight. Our guests on this month's gathering of artists is the Ames History Museum. And Alex is going to be our presenter. He is the exhibits manager. I think you've said, you said you've been there for eight years. Did I catch that right? Yep, a little um, over eight. So I'm not gonna steal any more of your time. I'm just gonna let you get started. All right. Well, thanks for everyone for joining me. I'm going to take you guys outside real quick, but let you guys know. We are, so I'm from the Ames History Museum. Um, if you're not familiar with that, maybe you've heard of the Ames Historical Society. That was one of our, um, we still go by that name, but the Ames History Museum is kind of new branding we've done in 2019. Um, sorry about the lighting here, but I wanted to get everybody out, kind of see a little bit of our building here. We're at the corner of Fifth and Douglas, so just Kitty Corner from the public library right over there. Um, but I wanted to show you some of the few things we've been doing to kind of combat COVID and get exhibits to people. So this is a great example um, of an exhibit we did uh, back in February for Black History Month. We did George Washington Carver. So some great history about him in our kind of in town history of him. We also have two other windows down here we've been able to use. We have an exhibit called Power and Pluck and this is about um, notable women of Story County. So each community that wanted to participate chose one woman from their county that they wanted to highlight. So it's a little hard to see in here, but we got some uh, Rowena Stevens um, from Ames, Carrie Ka Chapman Cat, that kind of stuff. So be sure to come check this one out if you're in Ames. This one will only be up in the window um, up until April 1st, and then we have a new exhibit that's gonna replace it. So be sure to come check that out. We are open. As of now, Fridays, noon to four, always check before you come in. Um, it's possible those hours may expand soon, but we are also open by appointment. So if you wanna come in on a Tuesday at 10, um, we can try to accommodate that as best we can and you know, of groups of five or six in there. So we'll give you a little bit of a tour today of some of our space. So you kind of walking in right off the bat here, try to keep my hand as steady as possible. Um, you can see right behind me, we have this wonderful timeline of Ames history. Now these, um, you know, a lot of the major events that have happened through the years, all the way from, you know, the town being founded, Iowa State getting here before the town, you know, up through the 2010 flood. And we're getting to about to the point to add another decade to this timeline because it's been up since 2013. So a great thing that people have kind of as a quick get to know Ames history thing. But our feature exhibit is Uncourt. The Spirited History of Alcohol in Ames. Now, this exhibit was uh, designed in 2018. We started planning it, and it went up in August of 2019 in preparation for the 100th anniversary of Prohibition, which kicked off on January 1st, 20, uh, 1920. So it was the 100th anniversary of that. So we wanted to tell some great uh, alcohol stories um, with Ames, because it's had this interesting relationship. So we'll kind of take you through part by part here. And I don't, you know, honestly, don't know if my, all my words are backwards or not. So I apologize, but I will flip the camera around a little You're bit. You're fine. But it, it's, is it backwards or is it regular? We can read the words. Okay, perfect. That's good to know. So we're starting here with our first section, prohibitionists and teetotalers. So one of the first interesting facts about Ames um, and Iowa is they both start out very dry. Um, the state attempts to put in um, laws restricting alcohol at the very beginning in the 1840s. Um, and in fact, um, back in the 1880s, we had a governor, Larrabee, as you'll see his picture right up there. He ran on the campaign slogan, there we go. A schoolhouse on every hill and no saloon in the valley. And that won him the 18, uh, I believe it was the 1882 election as governor. And you can actually still go visit his uh, mansion over in Claremont, Iowa. We're there. Now, Ames was founded dry. So we were a whistle stop town. We were built because we were on the Transcontinental Railroad. They needed um, another depot roughly 10 miles from Nevada. And they like the area because of the Iowa Creek and the Skunk River having water. Again, we're talking steam engines, so they need water to power them. So they like that area. And from the very beginning, when Ames was set up, it was founded dry by the Blair uh, Railroad and Land Company. So there's a company they set up for the land holdings for the railroad, 
So this company that would sell the deeds to citizens who wanted to find a place to live, set up a farm, it was written in their deed that if they sold spiritous liquors of any kind be, besides medicinal uses on their property, their deed would revert back to the land company. So basically, if you started a saloon, they could take the land away from you without even giving you any money on that. And that's just Ames's, you know, first little town when we're just, you know, four blocks by six blocks, roughly, not very big. And so that goes all the way back. And you can see up here, there's one of these original deeds that says that on there, right about there. And I believe this is the deed for land where First National Bank is today. So it was somebody's, somebody's house deed at one point. Now, who, who is uh, talking about anti-prohibition or for, for prohibition? We have one, one local gentleman, K.W. Brown. And let's see if I can get out a little bit farther here. You see all those wonderful, huge, uh, what I call like a playbill type thing. These were flyers that they would have posted on uh, telephone poles, trees, things like that in the areas that he was speaking. And so he, he started as a, he was a traveling salesman out of the, you know, Civil War vet, came to Ames shortly after, traveling salesman. Um, and so he would talk on Civil War and eventually he got into uh, prohibition and started talking nationally about that. So most of these playbills are from places in Iowa. Um, there's a few from New York where he would go back out east on his traveling. And so it's actually his grandson, Farwell T. Brown, some of you might be familiar with, the founder of the Historical Society. He has a auditorium at Ames Public Library named after him. So uh, KW actually uh, ran a couple times for governor. And let's see if I can get zoomed in here. There is his uh, 1912 badge for the for the national convention he was a delegate for. And you can kind of see on this panel over here, one of these little uh, flyers for when he ran in 1908. Uh, sadly, he did not do very good in the 1908 run for governor. Uh, Beryl F. Carroll, the Republican nominee, won with 54%. Brown came in third with 1.9%. So not a very good turnout for the prohibitionists that year. Um, so he was doing it kind of more of a local scale. Who do we have nationally that has an Ames connection? Well, some of you may be familiar with Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday Road, maybe, the cemetery over there. Now, Billy was born, we say Billy was born in Ames, but let's be real. Billy was born two years before the city of Ames was founded. So he's in rural Story County um, and Washington Township. And so if you're familiar with the dog park is on Billy Sunday Avenue down on South Duff near the uh, fire department, um, the family farm was not very far from that cemetery. They were right on that property, stretching all the way over to the rail uh, to the airport. So Billy was born there. Um, Billy's first real uh, claim to fame is not, you know, uh, prohibition. It's actually baseball. So uh, Billy has a pretty tough life. He is. Um, his dad passes away in the, from the Civil War um, just months after he's born. He lives in a, a soldier's orphan home um, for a little while. You know, he's living on his grandpa's farm south of town, and eventually they don't get along. So he moves out to Nevada, and he gets spotted by a, uh, a woman in Marshalltown who was um, related to A.G. Spaulding. And so they came out, Cap Anson from the Chicago White Stockings came out and they kind of recruited him basically. And so Billy gets into professional baseball in the 1880s and eventually he finds uh, religion at the local YMCA in Chicago. And that's when his uh, speaking career takes off. So he's known as the baseball evangelist. And you can see a nice picture of him kind of standing up here. He's very fire and brimstone, letting you know um, whether you, he's pretty Pretty open about letting you know whether you'll go to heaven or hell, depending on your lifestyle. Um, so Billy um, became basically this traveling preacher, go to town to town, spoke to millions of people. Um, if you're not familiar with him, just imagine uh, what Billy Graham would have based his career off of, because that's what happened there. We were fortunate to be able to get this uh, little water bottle down here on loan from the Winona Historical Society, where Billy's... Uh, home was at the end of his life. And that's where he donated his house to become a museum. So we were fortunate to get that on loan. Billy often brought his own water. This one's Poland Springs. Um, and the museum told us he always brought a case of that with him wherever he spoke. 
So he was not tempted to drink the local water, which might have bad quality, or the local booze. So that so Billy always had his water with him. All right, this story right behind us, the threatening 13. This is kind of one of those famous alcohol stories in Ames. Um, in 1868, so just four years after the town is founded, um, a young couple comes to town with the last name Day. We don't know their first names. And they um, set up a saloon in the basement of the Sherwood Hotel. I'll try to show you this picture here. Uh, get myself oriented. So here you go. The Sherwood Hotel is on the right. It might be the left. It's over that way. And the Ames, uh, another hotel known as the Ames Hotel, this is actually the site of the museum today. So this building over here, it was known as the Sherwood Hotel, today where the Octagon Center is. Uh, Mr. Day and his wife set up a saloon in the basement, pool table, all that, assured the local residents it was going to be a fine establishment, very clean and orderly, you know. Saloons were not seen as some a welcome thing into town necessarily. So he had to assure them it was going to be a fine establishment, not, not any, you know, out west kind of style stuff. Um, but apparently some of these young women in town got together and decided they, they didn't want this saloon here anyway. 13 of them, as the story goes, got together um, at the congregational church here in town and walked down to the saloon. Now, this is where some stories uh, change. Or we're, we're, the true story is unknown. We've heard this told in a different, couple different ways, a couple different versions. Um, there are no real, um, most of these stories were written 25 to 50 years after the event took place by people who were involved. So even their stories uh, don't quite line up. But one version of the story says they, uh, they tap politely on the door with the back of a hatchet to ask to be let in to talk to Mr. Day. Another version uh, says that they went across the street to the blacksmith, got a sledgehammer, they busted down the door, broke into the bar, smashed kegs of beer until there was about an inch of beer on there, smashed some of the furniture, and then promptly left when uh, the, the woman running the hotel above apparently threw some pepper down a stovepipe, which caused some kind of smoke gas and a tear gas kind of like scenario. And so everyone ran out trying to catch their breath. Mr. Day boarded up the door. He got, went to Marshalltown, got a lawyer, um, threatened to sue these 13 women, but the justice of the peace at the time, uh, Dan McCarthy said, um, yeah, Daniel McCarthy said, um, I'm not gonna do this. Now this was an early town, you know, they were kind of a tight knit community, pretty small. So I imagine uh, he really didn't probably want these 13 women really mad at them. So eventually they worked out a deal. Mr. Day got $50, went on his way to, to another town to set up a saloon. The women though decided that they would buy his candies and sweetmeats from him. So his only loss was the liquor. So that's pretty nice of them after running his whole business out of town, I'd say. So that's one of those fun stories that gets told a couple different ways by different sources in different years. Um, but a fun story nonetheless. Okay, working over to this side over here. This is kind of where we're ta actually talking about uh, the actual 1920s pro uh, prohibition. So the Noble Experiment was a, a name that it got um, nationally. Um, so we all know about prohibition in the 20s, starting 1920, January 1st. But however, Iowa actually started prohibition back in 1916, they started it. And that was done on the state level. Um, Back in the 1880s, there was a law passed that made saloons illegal. But then in 1893, they passed what was, um, was called the Watkins Bill. And that gave local communities, um, they were able to vote on saloons. So I think they could have like one saloon per thousand people if the community agreed it was okay to have it there. And so basically that, gave, that stopped prohibition and gave uh, a local option to communities to set up their own, to allow a saloon there basically. So, you know. Towns like Ames didn't get a saloon. Towns out, you know, over Eastern where there's a lot of German Americans, a lot of German immigrants, there were a lot of saloons set up there. So it's kind of to appease both of these sides. But in 1916, um, the Watkins bill is, is re uh, revoked. And so basically we go back to this earlier 1880s prohibition. So Iowa, we actually started four years earlier than the entire nation. And there were some other states that did the same thing also. We could do our own local laws. 
Um, and Ames is um, kind of seen behind me back here, some of these uh, graphs. Ames is a pretty dry town compared to uh, Story County in Iowa in general. There were some polls that were done um, through newspapers of the times, like the story, um, I'm sorry, the Ames Tribune did one. And usually, you know, you kind of see, this is a great one for, in 1917, they voted to get, um, to add prohibition to the con Iowa Constitution. And um, wet, wet is blue, red is dry. So you get just the, the state votes just barely wet, a, a thousand over. But Story County, it's like one to, you know, like uh, one to four, and then it's like one to five in Ames. So Ames has always been a little drier than Story County, than Iowa. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit more why that is here in just a minute. Might be able to see our little jail cell back here. This is a fun little story we had never heard about, but thank goodness for the digital newspaper where you can search terms like alcohol or keg. And that's where this one came up. So in 1909 in May, there were um, police were called. There were several uh, noisy singers uh, distracting people over near the depot on the west end of Main Street. Well, the police showed up, you know, told a lot of them to go home. Most did, but three guys had not had their fill of fun quite yet. They refused to go home. So they got locked up in Ames's uh, little two room jail. Now this building you're gonna see right here, this is on the site where YSS is. Um, now YSS was built as uh, City Hall in 1915, but this is the earlier version of that. And that little tiny room with the two windows, the little shorter building, that's the jail cell. So a two room jail, little windows going out the outside, that kind of deal. Um, so the police arrest these three gentlemen, throw them in one of the two jail cells there. But for whatever reason, it slipped their mind that the night before, on Friday, they had confiscated a keg from the depot that would, would have been delivered illegally. So they locked it up in the one place they had, the jail cell. So in jail number one, you got the keg of beer. In jail number two, you have these three guys that are already drunk, probably still ready to drink a little bit. Um, they somehow get the attention. They notice this keg next, sitting right next to them, their jailmate. Somehow they get the attention of some people on the street. They're able to get a little hot stove poker and a straw and they're able to push out the, the cork in the keg and get the straw in this and drink nearly the whole keg overnight. Little to the, the police knowing when they show up Sunday morning and probably find these guys drunker than when they threw them in the jail the night before. So the great thing about this one is the wonderful coverage in the Ames newspaper um, you know, they have headlines like city jail shows hospitality. Prisoners had a big keg party. Occupants of city jail tapped a keg of beer Sunday and served refreshments. So it's just wonderful. It's like they're, they're writing about it like they're throwing a little card club or something like that. So just a hilarious, hilarious story. Um, now the other side of the, uh, we got our coppers and our bootleggers here now. Back then, the police force was pretty small. Um, you know, in the 1890s, it was a one-man police force. Big, big Bill Ricketts right over there. Um, but mostly through Prohibition, um, 1920 through 33, we had William Kerr as chief. And there's one story I'd like to tell about him down here. Um, he got a call from, I believe it was the uh, Polk County Sheriff, called him saying they had a tip that there was going to be some bootleggers coming through Ames, um, and he and they were asking for some help. So they, um, they sent, uh, the sheriff asked the chief to send his men up to, I believe the north entrance and the, the north city limits um, uptown on, so that'd be highway 69. And his men would watch the, other, watch the other ones. Well, they sat up there for a couple hours that morning, nothing happened. Chief called them again, say, hey, we got another tip. There's gonna be some people coming through. And this time, instead of sending his men to where the, the sheriff or the chief told them to, the county sheriff, uh, the chief sent his men to the other one. And little did they know, right on time, here comes a truck full of bootleg booze coming through. Uh, Kier called the Polk County Sheriff and thank, thanked him for his tip and them nabbing the guys there. Now, no story of, oops, I apologize here. Ooh. 
I think you're still with me. I, I apologize. I hit a button on my phone accidentally. Good. Okay. Don't look like I lost you. Uh, now, no prohibition story can be complete without talking about speakeasies. Uh, prior to prohibition, the main form of a place to get a drink was a saloon. Saloons were a mostly men only club. Um, women were not, proper women, I will say, would not have been seen there. There were women of um, other professions that would frequently be at a saloon. I'll let you leave your guests up to that. Um, so it wasn't really a place where the sex is mixed. The speakeasy changes that, um, you know, with the roaring 20s going on, um, these clubs go underground. So the saloons get like knocked out over, you know, almost overnight. And these speakeasies pop up and for whatever reason, they're, they're gender friendly. You know, this is kind of the first place women can go and have fun like that. And it becomes uh, much more of an equal thing where they're both going to the same place. So um, really the speakeasy kind of brought in some of, some of that. Now we thought it would be fun to make our own little speakeasy here, hiding it right behind our bookcase. I'll bring you in here a little bit so you can see some of this. So we've got some old old radios, old telephones, some ca a cash register from our collection. Got some music playing in here. So it's got the nice dark feel of what a speakeasy bar would kind of would feel like in our minds. And we were also able to include bootlegging stories into the bar top here. So, you know, you get some great stories like them raiding a moonshine or um, a story about a Chicago bootlegger that got nabbed here. And I'll come outside so the music's a little quieter, but that's, that's a great story. Um, we found that in the newspaper. A guy from Chicago came out to here, um, got pulled over, had booze in his car. And um, when the police saw that, they realized he also had a list. And, it, and the newspaper says that the list was of Ames's prominent young and not so young men that he was about to deliver to. Unfortunately, that we checked at the police department. They don't have the list anymore. They get record, rid of their records after so many years. Um, so we can, all we can do is speculate who might have been on that delivery. But uh, it's kind of, the guy ended up having to, he called his boss out in Chicago to, to bail him out of a jail, but he didn't help him. So he, had, he called his last attempt, which was his mother-in-law. Um, he'd just been married the year before, and he had told them that he was a traveling... Um, automobile parts salesman. So I'm pretty sure they were probably pretty surprised when he called get with uh, boot neck, bootlegging charges, I'm sure. So uh, saloon in town in Ames, was there one? Um, that's a good question. We don't know for sure. There, there are no firsthand accounts of a, you know, the J or the speakeasy getting raided. Um, we don't have any accounts of, you know, people writing about the speakeasy that they visited that a firsthand account or even a second-hand account of someone saying like, yeah, my dad used to go down there all the time. There is a community rumor about the Sheldon Mudd Hotel. There is a space in their basement, I've, I've seen it, where they have the floors nicely tiled, just like it would be up in the lobby when that was built in 1915. So it was used for something down there. There's a stairwell that was looks like it was added in after the fact, um, and it came up on the alley side, but if anybody's familiar with the Sheldon Munn and the old city hall, the YSS building, um, where that door would have came out right at the alley side was directly across the street from the police station. So either it was Ames's best kept secret or worst kept secret that no one cared about. Um, so we really don't know, you know, the Sheldon Munn was a very happening place back then. It was the gathering place of the downtown and the community in general. So I think we can safely say that it, the, sh the hotel probably wasn't very dry, but whether a, le a legit speaky was easy was in the basement, as of now, we can't say for sure, but we'd love to hear more information if anybody has any on that. Now, uh, transitioning after uh, prohibition, um, just nearly before it ends, FDR actually signs the 3.2 bill beer, which allows beer of 3.2% alcohol to be sold. So that kind of starts things going. And in Ames, it basically happened right away. Um, right when that gets passed, um, I think about 12 or 14 people in town put in permits for beer. Now, back then it was different. You own, um, To serve beer, you had to be a restaurant and you had to make over 50% of your income from food, not from liquor or beer. So a little bit different than what we think of as a bar today, but that's all that existed. And 
Uh, that night that the city council approved, the city approved they would allow beer permits in certain areas of town, so mainly downtown and, and select areas of campus town. And people were waiting. Um, when the council approved it, the rooms cheered. Um, uh, they said the beer trail followed everyone up to the county clerk's office where they were going to get their permit permit signed. Beer trucks were waiting in the streets to get the approval that these places got their beer permits so they can uh, unload. And it was said that it was the most happening Thursday night that Ames had seen in a long time. Uh, people are waiting for you. You could only get served a beer if you were sitting in a chair, so like at the counter or at a booth. And people were waiting for people to get up so they could get in their chair and get an order there. So. Kind of fun. Now transitioning more to like the 60s and stuff like that, um, we got these fun little things I'd like to show you. Some of you may remember uh, collegiate manufacturing that made sweatshirts and pennants and t-shirts and these stuffed animals called bottle babies were made in the 1960s. They are marketed as gifts for grown-ups. You lift the head of the uh, kangaroo right there off to reveal uh, a booze bottle back there. They said, you know, Take it to the park, take it to the football game. So I'm sure we could all imagine, uh, you know, grown men walking into then Clyde Williams Field with a pink elephant under their arm. That doesn't look suspicious at all. Now transitioning to the 60s. Now prior to the 60s, Ames is a very, very dry town. Um, post prohibition, Iowa is set up with state liquor stores. So the only place you can buy liquor is from a store that is run by the state. And so they set it up in select communities and Ames petitioned for a long time not to have one. And a lot of that is kind of our relationship with the college. They're trying to make sure that the town is, you know, safe and wholesome. They don't want this, they don't want to give the image of a party school because they want parents to feel like Ames is a trustworthy community to send your kid to and he's gonna get a good education and not get in trouble. So there's this kind of balance they're always trying to get. Um, but what, ch you know, what changed in the 60s? The first one is liquor by the drink. So prior to 1963 in Iowa, you could not just go to, you know, there were no bars, but if you went to one of those places that was serving beer, you couldn't go up and ask for a, a whiskey and Coke. You couldn't do that. The only way to do it would be to go to your local state liquor store, buy your bottle, brown bag it, bring it into the restaurant where they would give you setups. Now, these are two glasses from Frango's Cafe and the Rainbow Cafe. And you'd go into that restaurant and you'd order, give me a round of setups. And they would bring you two glasses filled with ice um, and about three fourths full of Coke or whatever. They'd leave a little bit off of the pop or set it up, whatever you wanted. And then it, perfectly normal for you to pull your bottle out of your jacket and top them off and have your drink like that. Um, but in 63, they actually get uh, liquor by the drink. And so you could get a liquor license to serve by the drink. And that's where some of these um, like big clubs like the Elks and Moose get really huge because you could keep bottles at these clubs and they would keep it for you and you could get the Coke and do all that without having to bring your bottle in with you. So a lot of those organizations grew very fast because of that. I mentioned the state state liquor stores again. Um, so they start in 34 is, is, is the earliest opposition from the town saying that they don't want them. Uh, we don't want it in our town. There's uh, student leaders on Iowa State campus that say we also don't want it. But finally, in 1963, a, sem a seven member delegation from Ames uh, petitioned the city council to allow a state liquor store in Ames. Now, prior to that, Ames, so right before that, Ames is the biggest city in the state without a liquor store and the two busiest uh, stores in the entire state, it said at one point, were Nevada and, and Boone. And so you pretty well knew that, you know, Ames might not be the place to have all the fun you wanted to. You could easily go to Boone or Nevada or some of those other communities where we see lots of examples of, uh, you know, drinking and uh, speakeasies and stuff like that in town. And so these stores, you had to go in, you, you, they limited, you had a little permit book, just like that. You told them the number of, you know, from a sign up on the wall, you said, give me 1328, which might be Hawkeye vodka. And they'd give you, you know, the amount they could give you of that, depending on the permit. So that really kind of ushers in the wet era, that mid sixties transition when we get our own liquor store, liquor by the drink happens. Um, the other thing is Campus Town. For a long time, um, 
right when they first get beer permits in the 30s, they allow a few into campus town at some of these restaurants. <clears throat> but by 1942, um, the council pass, passes stricter laws and basically they're drawing outlines around downtown where a bar, where you can get this permit. And if you're outside those lines, you can't get it. And they had other rules like you couldn't be 175 feet from a church or a school. Well, in campus town, that's, that's pretty hard to do with Iowa State across the street. You got, uh, you know, St. John's one way, you have uh, the, the Methodist Church the other way, you have uh, Welch Elementary, Crawford Elementary south of there. It's a very narrow window where you can fit in a bar in those areas. Uh, but finally, in 1966, council removed the downtown only restriction on beer permits and the pizza den at 121 uh, Welch Avenue is the kind of the first post uh, out of that era. And of course, we know they can carry on them today. And there's some other things that have gone on through the years that kind of, you know, had a big impact on our community, including uh, the Moonlight Express. So, you know, we're all familiar with Cy Ride, I think, you know, their origin goes back to the 1970s, but it was in uh, 1984 that they uh, first started what they called Night Ride back then, eventually now called the Moonlight Express or um, shorthanded called the Drunk Bus for people here in town. Um, but they did a lot of studies of the passengers over the years. Um, there was quite a few bad drinking and driving accidents in the 80s that really um, kind of pushed for this to, to happen. Um, but there was also community uh, resistance to it also saying that, you know, if we're going to give them a ride home, we're just encouraging them to drink too much. So kind of one of those things you have to take the good with the bad a little bit. Um, but I think we can safely say that that has probably stopped a lot of drunk driving here in Ames, especially with the college population. Now, you, no talk about alcohol in Ames would be complete without Visha, mm -hmm. the Visha riots. Now, those um, have happened quite a few times through the years. The first one taking place back in 1988. Um, you know, a lot of these things ha happening. There's one in 1992, 1994. Um, you know, they try to add more measures. There's punishments to some of these, including, you know, um, sometimes Visha would be um, alcohol free the next year. Um, in 2004, there was um, a riot that caused over a quarter million dollars in damage, and it was canceled in 2014 completely, but resumed until 2016. Um, so sometimes they would just curb the entertainment. They wouldn't have the concerts, things like that. <clears throat> now, most of the time, um, if I remember right, and all those, all those riots happened the weekend, like at the end of Visha. So usually it ends on Sunday, I forget exactly. But that weekend, that Friday, Saturday is typically when these riots happen. So there's little time to do kind of punishment associated with that visa. Usually you're, they're thinking about what to take away from next visa, that kind of a thing. But in visa 2014, this time it was quite different. A uh, riot broke out on, a, on the Tuesday. So like the second or third day of visa, um, the, a riot broke out and it actually, um, one person was severely injured and that caused them to actually cancel Visha for the whole week. So very kind of a, a different situation than the riots in the past, given that it happened so early, they could do some things, uh, mitigation that other week to just stop the drinking going on. Now, it, um, we do have some items on loan. I wanna show you these from uh, Dick Webb, who is on the police force. He's retired now. Um, he, he has on loan his gas mask part of his uh, Visha riot gear and also uh, his police baton right here. So we we're very fortunate. Dick came in, um, admired some of our police stuff in a different part of the exhibit and said, hey, Visha, I got some things over here. So sometimes um, us putting up an exhibit, um, it's always tough when people come in after the exhibit's up and want us to display display something. But um, this item was so cool that we, we made room for it. Um, we can't always necessarily accommodate that but we are very grateful for Dick uh, loaning those to us and extending the loan when this exhibit got interrupted shortly um, because of COVID. Now we wanted to talk about the bars in town and we knew, you know, our space here is not, we are not working with a space the size of a high school gym or anything like that. So how, you know, everyone we knew was gonna come in and wanna hear about their bar, this bar that they were a part of, the one they enjoyed when they were in college or one they go to now or the first one they went in town. So we wanted to find a way to kind of bring some of that into the exhibit. We were able to get some artifacts on display here, some things from that place, Mondo's on Main, Mississippi Queen, 
a few other um, just random, you know, side beers and things like that. But this, uh, this big martini glass up here, see if I can get the glare right. So this martini glass is made out of every name, a name of every bar that we were able to find in the telephone books. Um, the bigger the name, the longer the bar has been around. So you, you can kind of see Sportsman's Lounge right there. Uh, Sporties is the oldest continuously running bar here in Ames. Uh, it started in 1949. So it's celebrating its uh, 71st year as a bar, which is crazy. Now it was Sportsman's Cafe when it first started. Remember that 50% uh, alcohol rule. So that's, so the definition of a bar changes frequently through the decades. And that's something you'll notice on that. Some of these smaller names, you'll notice there are places like Tom's Grill and Rusty's Bar and Grill and these other places. And we had to include those during a certain era because that was honestly the only place you could go get a cold beer on tap, which is about the minimum equivalent of a bar. But, you know, today it's a lot differently. You know, our, that definition, we can't quite fit that in, you know, just about every restaurant in town has a bar now. It's not as rare as it used to be. So um, for modern day bars, we only included ones that are listed under nightclubs, taverns, cocktail lounges, bars, you know, places that are open till 2 a.m., a typical bar schedule. So we thought that was a lot of fun, a fun way for people to still go in and maybe see that bar, look for that bar that they remember when they first moved to town, you know, whether it's you know, one of these staples like the Tip Top or Whiskey River or the Fox Lounge, or if it's, you know, the Cave-In in Campus Town, if you remember some of those. Um, we also have a, a small little space over here. We're able to talk about local options. So um, beginning just in 2014 was the first time that you could get uh, legally brewed beer in Ames. Um, that's when Old Main started and it, it closed just a few years ago. Actually, while we were in the middle of writing this panel, Old Main closed, um, but we wanted to let people know, like, this is kind of a new phenomenon, you know, people were making bootleg beer and things like that out in the country around, around that era, but never before have we had stuff actually made here in Ames. Um, so we still have a few that are still around and open, Torrent Brewing Company downtown, and then out in the country, we have Alluvial Brewing and Prairie Moon Winery. So Prairie Moon's kind of the one winery that's in the Ames more specific location, but there's a few more in Story County. So we wanted to honor those people and let them know that, you know, once you're done around here, if you're getting a little thirsty, you could head out and get a drink at their place. So that's the, that's the gist of Uncorked. I wasn't able to tell every story in here. So please, if you want to come in, we're open Friday, noon to four. Um, or if you want to come in with a few people in a group um, during the day on, an, on another day without the open hours, we can always schedule an appointment. Um, you know, also be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We're always putting stuff on there. YouTube, we have a channel from. And I wanted to show one last kind of thing. Um, since if you're not able to in the area to come see the exhibit or you're just not quite ready to get in that kind of public yet, we've been also working on some very cool virtual um, exhibits. I'm going to switch my camera here and just show you my computer screen real quick to show you this one. Okay. So this is one that we did on George Washington Carver. Forgive me, I'm having a hard time getting my, there we go, a little straighter. So these are kind of immersive exhibits that you can either do on your own, sitting from your couch, or you can get it started here, or you can take this and follow along. Sorry, it's just taking a second to load it for whatever reason. A little slow internet here right now. So this is a 360 picture. I took down at the Kellogg intersection when there wasn't much traffic. Um, but from here is kind of a hub where you can go to all these dots that are loading. Forgive me, I'm on kind of a slow computer down here. Um, but basically these exhibits are these, they're 360, so it's kind of immersive. And there are touch points where you can um, go to another location or has an informational dot that will give you some information about the place. So this George Washington Carver one we did for Black History Month, and it features uh, places in Ames that have a George Washington Carver connection. So, you know, some of them might be a building on campus. Um, 
maybe a house down in Old Town where, professor, where one of George's professors lived that he would have visited frequently. Um, or maybe it's a, a modern landmark in honor of George uh, Washington Carver, like our pier on Fifth Street at uh, Fifth and Burnett or George Washington Carver Avenue. So I was hoping I could get in and click a little bit here. Forgive me for being just a tad slow. Let's see if I can restart it. Here we go. So I'm gonna, we're just gonna zoom over to Iowa State campus here because this is a great, great image to show. So it'll transition you from one full picture to another where you can zip all the way around. And so this one I'm gonna pull up, um, Chemistry Hall, let's pull up. So this is a good one, I guess. Carver Hall and Plaza. So Carver Hall on Iowa State campus named after him, obviously. And so you can click on it. And you could tell I did this that week uh, after we got about a foot of snow, I trenched through campus to get it here. So you can click on here, it'll give you more information. So um, kind of the history of how this building got built, um, how it got named in his honor. And, and a lot of times there'll be a close up picture. So sometimes in some of these more Historic buildings, I'll find another good one here, like um, old chemistry hall. So the chemistry building that George was at is no longer around. It burned down in 1913, but it's at the site of Pearson Hall. So we'll take you to Pearson and then you'll get some information about that building and what George was, what George used it for. But then there'll also be some historic images showing you what it used to look like if the area has changed a lot. So. We thought those have been really fun. We've had over 2,000, almost 2,000 people view that part of the exhibit already. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is we are a member-based organization, and that's where most of our funding comes from. So over 50% of our funding comes from um, people in the community who sign up for a yearly membership, which can be as cheap as $15 for your first year, um, and also other donations. So we are a private nonprofit. We aren't a wing of the city or anything like that. We do get some city money, but that's some, a grant that we have to apply for every year and kind of show what we're doing with that money. So those go to specific projects that we're um, trying to fund or get done, that kind of a thing. So we, we are only here because of the community support. So if you are a member and you're in this group, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And if you're not, um, feel free to sign up. We got, um, you get a quarterly newsletter and member, you'll get discount at the gift shop. And we're, we're trying to work on more member benefits for the future here too. So keep that in mind if you wanna find a local place to support local history. Well, I think I've talked for quite a while here. It looks like quite a while. Uh, does anybody got any, any questions on there at all, Jennifer? I don't see anything in the chat, but if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat. We're probably a small enough group that if you just want to speak up and ask a question, that is allowed as well. So I have a question. Go sure, for it. Go for it. <laughs> I'm, this is Kyle. In 2015, I was the um, uh, director of the Design on Main Gallery in downtown. It's now where Dog Eared Books is. Yeah. Um, I had heard while I was there, I heard a rumor that somebody said, oh, it used to be a speakeasy. And if you went down into the basement, there was a, the basement, I, I'm sure they've fixed it up since uh, ISU was there, but it was really skanky. And it mm. had these real sketchy little areas. There were, um, there was a men's room and a ladies room that you would not want to go in. Um, <laughs> and it just kind of fit, it felt like it shouldn't be there. And it had mm. old um, crumbling walls, but they also had incredibly old wallpaper down there. And I was wondering if that, do you know if that was ever a bar or a speakeasy in that building? Um, let's see. I believe there was a, um, I believe there was a, there was a bar in there in, um, after 1971, there was, um, actually one of those ones we had over here. I believe it was that, that place. It was an Australian themed bar. And there was also one called Gold's. And I think some, one of, they were upstairs. And I think that place might've been in the basement, um, hmm. But I don't, so that might, I wonder if that's what you're seeing a little bit of that because prior to that, that building was um, from almost its, when it was built back in the 18, uh, 1880s, that was the Tilden store. 
um, Ames's longest running department store. And it was there up until 1971. And um, in the basement, I know they did, they had alterations down there. And that's kind of where the collegiate manufacturing company started that we mentioned those bottle babies was born out of that. They kept the seamstresses busy when there weren't alterations by making uh, pennants for the, for the schools, for, for Iowa State College. And so I know that was down there for a long time until it morphed and became collegiate manufacturing. The other reason I would say it probably would be very unlikely there was ever a bar in the basement there is because the Tildens were uh, related to the Browns, our famous prohibitionist here in town. Uh, so that would have been, um, kind of do the math here, Farwell Brown, our founder, which that would have been his grandfather, um, married a Tilden. And so I would, I think the Tildens were also teetotalers. So I would be very surprised to find out that a speakeasy would have been in the basement of their, their building there. But I, it's probably going back to those 1970s bars, I bet you. I know they had, uh, yeah, one of those bars. I think that that place was famous for peanuts all over the floor and stuff like that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that good question. There's a comment. Seen a question. When did Iowa get out of the liquor store business and are they still, I missed the very end of that. Are they still the only wholesaler for liquor? Um, I don't know about the wholesale question on that one. That one, I don't think I dived into, but the, um, when did they go away? In 1986, uh, the, the legislation was passed to end the state's monopoly on the liquor stores. And so um, they started state liquidations of all their stuff. Um, let's see. Ames had, at that point, had two liquor stores, and they shut down in March of 1987. And um, in the next six months, uh, six private retail liquor stores opened up. And uh, what we're calling the oldest liquor store in town is actually Cyclone Liquors over by hy V there. And that, um, we're, that one is kind of an interesting one. Uh, the dates on how long that's been a state liquor store is interesting because that was a state liquor store that transitioned into a private liquor store. So uh, mm -hmm. you can kind of count that pre liquor, that pre uh, when it was the state one like that, but it, uh, it's kind of a weird little question like that. So basically from, you know, 60, uh, 66, I think, 63 to 87, they were here in Ames. All right, I thought I saw another question popped up. Did you, did you see that one, Jen? Um, someone, Catherine, Catherine just cop commented, I know where beer, Billy Sunday is buried in Ames. Oh, actually, Billy Sunday is not buried in Ames. Uh, Billy's family is buried here in Ames. Uh, um, so his mother, his, I believe, two brothers and his grandparents um, are out at that cemetery, the, the Sunday, um, the Corey family cemetery is what they call it. That was his grandfather, Squire Corey, that farm out there. And Billy's actually buried out in Chicago. Um, that's just where his career took him. So he got pretty far away from Ames at that point. I saw another question look like uh, expansion of the museum itself. So yes, if you've ever been to our museum, um, you'll notice it's it could be bigger. We have a lot more stuff we'd like to show off. Um, our building is not very big and not really built like a museum. If you've ever been down here, it's a, you know it's kind of an office-like building. So we are hoping um, at some point in the in the near future to be able to expand our museum in one way or another. We're still you know looking into that. We don't have a solid answer yet for the for the community at large yet, but. We are, we are actively pursuing ways to give ourselves the proper exhibit space that we, that we need over here. So I saw another one, is the graphic of all the bars available? We have not made that available. We've only printed it for here, but that's a good question. Um, you know, we've done some little posters like that in the past and they, uh, they haven't sold very well. So I guess hearing that people are interested in that lets us know that maybe this is one that would be fun. Um, it might just end up being one that, um, you know, once the exhibits down or getting towards the end, we might just have fun and put that on social media and let people have it, you know, and if they want to go print it out, um, that kind of a thing. So I, I might mention that to, uh, to our director who does a lot of our social media, that maybe that'll be a fun Instagram post for people to be able to zoom in and, and we'll put it on Facebook maybe to go find their bars. 
I imagine we'll get a lot of questions after that post though. <laughs> People want to know where was that bar? When was it open? <laughs> we only have the names up there, but yeah, something like that. Well, I'll think about that. We'll, we'll look in, follow us on Facebook. You'll be sure to hear about it if we do announce that. All right, any more questions? Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I, I probably I talked longer than I thought it would. That hour has just flown right by. So hopefully everybody found that very uh, informative. If you want to learn more, you know, about our organization, our website's ameshistory.org. You know, follow us on Facebook. We're putting out a historic fo photo on Facebook every day. We just put one up of, uh, oh, was it uh, Lincoln Way back in 1974, I think, kind of near where um, the High V Lincoln Center is looking down that road. And we got 25,000 people to click on that photo and look at it. So we're always putting a lot of really cool photos on there and, um, and lots of posts. You know, if you're following our lecture series, we've gone digital with our lecture series. So our next one, you can get this info on Facebook, but our next one is, um, I believe on March 30th, forgive me, I don't have it in front of me, but we're doing uh, steam liners in Iowa. So Bob Bourne, who was on our board, former SciRide transit director, he is gonna talk about trains running through uh, in Iowa, all the major train lines and give you kind of catch you up on all that. So be sure to tune into those and find us on Facebook and all these other places. Someone just asked if there will be a recording of this tape, of this talk, and we will put it on the Ames Community Arts Council um, YouTube page. So find us there. Alex, thank you so very, very much. This was really, really incredibly interesting. Um, I don't really have anything amazing to say other than thank you so much for giving us a part of your evening. I'm so glad we were able to see the space this way in a time when it's harder to get there. And we look forward to when the doors can be open more regularly. But as he mentioned, um, they're open on Fridays from 10 to 4. And by appointment, all you have to do is make a phone call and someone will be there to help you um, see the space in real life. Sure. Yeah. That's actually on Friday. It's noon to four. Oh, sorry. That's all right. And, and, and yeah, and if you'd like to get in any other day that beyond that, uh, please call us at least a couple days ahead of time so we can make sure. We we only have a two-person staff. And, and so we're managing volunteers that are still coming in and other thing, you know, other deadlines we have. So please call ahead of time and we can usually always make those appointments work as long as we have a day or two's notice. So yeah, feel free to. Thank you so much. We really appreciate everybody tuning in. Silent applause. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank you.